So I thought we'd start off with a little introduction to this topic and via discussion. And um, when, I, when I do this in my in-person classes, I ask them about their observations about the acute effects of cannabis and where those effects come from and what explains the differences across people. And so when I ask that question, and, then, and you can think about it as I'm talking too, <clears throat> You know, what are the effects of cannabis? Well, some people will say, oh, it makes you sleepy. Some people will say, oh, it makes you super high or energetic or euphoric. Um, and so we, as you go across the room, people have different, um, different observations in terms of what they see uh, in terms of the effects. And then I ask them where these effects come from. And why the difference is why does one person say, oh, cannabis makes you, you know, sleepy uh, or slows you down. Another person will say, oh, cannabis uh, makes you euphoric, makes you feel good. Um, one person will say it makes, you know, makes you anxious and paranoid. So these are very different effects that people are talking about. And what explains the difference? in those effects. And um, so we're going to talk about that today in terms of the plant um, biology. Of course, another important point here is that the, the biology of the people is quite different too, not just the biology, but also you know where they come from, who they are, their environment. So there are lots of different factors here that can influence the effects of cannabis. But mostly we'll talk about, in this lecture, the plant and the plant biology. So the plant. The plant has been uh, under cultivation by humans for millennia, approximately 8,000 years. And by extension, what this means, too, of course, is that, that it has been selection um, from humans. So the humans have basically been uh, cultivating this um, for certain characteristics over all these many years. The overarching family here is uh, cannabacea. And um, interestingly enough, cannabis and humulus, or hops, are relatives in the same extended family. Now there's been some uh, quite a bit of debate about subspecies of cannabis, and that's based on both taxonomic and morphological differences. So, there, and we'll we'll cover that in this lecture in terms of some of these morphological differences, as well as differences uh, in chemistry and so forth. Here, the the point really is that academics, you know, scientists um, still debate the fine details about.
exactly what's going on here in terms of the genetics and of the plant. Um, but broadly speaking, most people recognize two subspecies, uh, sativa and indica, and then also there's some recognition for a third called ruderalis. Um, this is more sort of the lay people uh, version of the um, the different um, plants. So this gives you an, an idea of what we're talking about when we talk about sativa and indica and ruderalis. Sativa was basically um, originally uh, seen as useful for fiber and oil and food. From a medical perspective, it has uh, diverse compounds. It also has a high biomass. And you can see here it is the tallest of the, um, the three uh, subspecies. Indica is a shorter and bushier um, uh, plant with higher THC on the medical side and a uh, higher yield in terms of the height of the plant. And the ruderalis is this sort of scrawny little guy over here, um, early flowering, hardy in northern climates, and um, obviously a very small, a much smaller plant. And you can read more about this on the, and there's um, very similar stuff all over the internet in terms of the different uh, subspecies. This comes from a presentation at the International Academy Research Society. And um, uh, so basically, um, here we have the different, again, the three different versions. And you can read about the morphology, more details about the physiology and the chemistry. And um, what people sort of see is the difference in psychoactivity across these three. And also some of this, you know, work or linkages, I wouldn't say this is based on research, uh, in terms of what people basically report anecdotally as the, the medical indications about why people might use one version versus another. Again, this is all anecdotal. And what we're going to talk a lot more about the science of this and throughout the course. Um, but this just gives you a, a nice kind of overview of what kind of the common views of these different subspecies. Uh, okay, so now let's get more into the research on the cannabis plant. So how do studies, how do scientists study the plant, right? Well, there's really a couple of th three things they're looking at when they're talking about the plant. One is morphology. What, you know, this is based on the shape of the leaves and the shape of the plant. Um, and uh, the other is chemical. So when we talk about different chemovars, so different um, levels of THC versus CBD versus other terpenes, et cetera. And then a third dimension that um, is useful here is the underlying genetic architecture. So this really brings us up to date in terms of modern approaches. And um, here there's all kinds of super cool science we can do looking at the genetic architecture and how it differs from plant to plant and then relate that genetic architecture back to the morphology and back to the chemical side or the medical side of this. So um, why is this important? Because if you're, if you're interested in the medical aspects, right, then you're interested in, in trying to basically figure out which um, compounds are important for which medical indications, right? So what, what role does THC play? What role does CBD play? How those differ in different plants? What role do um, you know, other cannabinoids play? CBC, CBG, so, uh, or terpenes. And so this is you know, trying to figure out the genetics and the chemical makeup. I think it's very important in terms of pushing forward the research on, uh, on how these different cannabinoids may be useful um, for different uh, medical indications. And again, just in terms of the morphology, you see the morphology differences here in the leaves, the sativa leaf, the, the broad leaf, and indica, and then the ruderalis here, very different. And then again, kind of a summary of, of how these plants differ in terms of morphology. So the structure of the plant is illustrated here on the right in terms of um, different parts of the plant. And the flowers of the female plants are covered with sticky resinous trichomes. Trichomes are basically what looks like a sort of a stalk with a bulb on the end, right? And inside that 
bulb. Um, that's where the THC and CBD and other cannabinoids reside. And so trichomes, again, contain all the, the sort of the important stuff. And um, they're um, not easy to see unless you have magnification, but they basically exist in, in the flower of the plant. And then we have the other important pieces, um, you know, parts of the plant here too, um, that you can look at in terms of, you know, fan leaves, the nodes, the stems, etc. Okay, so THC and CBD, that's where we're primarily focused here in terms of this course. I already mentioned that trichomes um, contain these cannabinoids, and, and trichomes are, you know, pretty much all over the plant, but most concentrated in the buds and the flowers. And again, the two most studied, the two most researched cannabinoids are THC and CBD. And so you saw the illustration of the trichomes, but these little guys, little hair-like things in here, those are the actual trichomes in a picture. And um, maybe they're easier to see over here, but you see the stalk and the little ball, right, where um, it contains the uh, cannabinoids. So what about the chemistry? How does this work in terms of the plant chemistry? Well, there's a common precursor here. Um, and then that precursor is the CBG. Um, CBG then, this is CBG over here, CBGA, um, via synthases gets turned into THCA and CBDA. And so what happens after, so, so, so CBG becomes THCA and CBDA, and then those basically, through a process called decarboxylation, um, basically through heat and or exposure to oxygen converts the THC, the A version to THC and CBDA to CBD. So here you see this entire process here from the common precursors um, through the <coughs> THCA um, to THC and CBDA to CBD. Um, and oxidation actually, there's a, a kind of another step in here, it's not illustrated on the right, but oxidation often also turns THC uh, into CBN or cannabinol. Okay, so I want to talk some about some cutting edge work done by another professor here at the University of Colorado, and uh, you'll also see um, Professor Nolan Cain in one of the interviews that I did. And he had a super, I think, interesting discussion with him, and he's done a lot of work on the genetics of uh, of cannabis plants. He's analyzed well over a thousand genomes. And he's looked at diverse um, samples from hemp to land race um, varieties to wild feral varieties and modern varieties, you know, collected from all over the place, including um, dispensaries, or mostly dispensaries, actually. And basically what he's doing here is he's sequencing these genomes and then lining them up to see how, they are, how they're different and or related. Um, so he's published some papers, and I'll basically be summarizing the uh, you know, some of this, the the data from those papers in the next few slides, but this is the actual you know one of the the, the important citations here. You can go back and, and look at this paper if you're interested in reading more about this. And so basically, what he's been doing is he's been trying to put together these phylogenetic neighbor networks, where he's basically um, on a genetic basis clustering related. Strains of cannabis, and so this is one of the earlier slides with a f with fewer uh, samples. But you can see here, you know that the hemp varieties are uh, clustering together in terms of their genetics, and then you over here you have um, a number of um, strains that you can find dispensary, super lemon haze, urban poison, canatonic uh, harlequin, Maui wow clustering up here, and then you have the, the cushions down here clustering together. And that was an earlier version. He's um, obviously, as I mentioned, thousands of genomes into this now. So with thousands of samples, these phylogenetic neighborhood networks start to get bigger and bigger and bigger, and of course, very hard to display on a screen. So here, in, though you can't read the strains, what you can see is that this is becoming a very, 
very um, uh, sophisticated approach to, to looking at how these genetics are related to, to you know, how different strains are related to each other via genetics, and also coming up with these sort of broad categories. So these cluster of strains that appear are more broad leaf drug types. This cluster down here, more of the hemp varietals, and then we have also the, the more narrow leaf sativa type um, drug types down here. And then one of the later iterations, or latest iterations, again, uh, completely filling up the space in terms of sequencing these different samples, these different strains. It starts to get very complicated. I blew up some of this just so you can see um, what this looks like. Uh, and, you, and you see some of these related uh, strains over here. Um, Blue Dream, Pineapple Express, and then um, over here, uh, Skywalker OG, Girl Scout cookies, etc. And then it kind of just kind of cool is looking at the hemp type strains uh, down here. Um, uh, also um, called uh, narrow leaf drug type strains. But uh, I always find this fascinating, right? It's kind of fun. The feral Nebraska number one. So basically, uh, no one picked this up in a, some uh, day in Nebraska somewhere, right, which um, goes to show you just how uh, ubiquitous the, the plant can be in terms of surviving in places where it probably shouldn't, uh, shouldn't be surviving. So, But then also looking at some key differences, not just in terms of genetics, but also in terms of the levels of different cannabinoids. And again, you can refer back to, to his work for some of this, but looking at, for example, how broadleaf broad leaf drug type um, compares to narrowleaf drug type compares to hemp, right? And what you see here is very clear differences in terms of the THCA, um, where the broadleaf is higher than narrow leaf is slightly lower, and of course the hemp is way, way lower. And then the, basically the opposite for CBDA, where um, the uh, broad leaf is, um, is low, the narrow leaf is somewhere, uh, you know, not quite in the middle, but higher. And then the hemp variety is much higher in terms of the CBD. And then also looking at the other connections, and again, how they differ across these different um, genetic uh, sort of groupings. And uh, what you see here again is that, um, you know, they're not just different in terms of morphology and genetics, but they also differ in terms of their, their chemistry and their cannabinoid makeup. Same with terpenes. Um, not all terpenes are um, that different, but some of them are clear. Different mercine is a good example of being clearly different across those different uh, groupings. So, in terms of just kind of summarize the genetic variation within cannabis, there are at least three major lineages, and probably more than that, that differ genetically, morphologically, ecologically, and chemically. And again, I refer you back to the interview with Nolan Kane. We'll talk, he'll talk more about these issues. And then going back to where we started this lecture, right, why is it that people report different effects? Well, the, the again, one reason is because people are different, but the other reason is because the plant, you know, different uh, types of flower, different genetic versions, different strains can differ dramatically in terms of the chemical make. And, um, and not just, uh, remember, it's not just differing on one thing, it's differing on many things, which also means the interaction among those things can be different across different versions. 
So um, when we talk about those different versions, we, we also can talk about uh, chemovars as a way to put it also. And so you can, you know, you can view these different genetic groupings as, you know, we're broadly leaf, narrow leaf, but also you can view them as THC type, hybrid CBD type, just to sort of denote the chemical differences across these different versions. And then, you know, it's worth noting too that for many, many years, the only way to study the effects of cannabis was to get your cannabis from the uh, University of Mississippi farm that was designated to grow uh, cannabis for the government. And so a lot of what, you know, the studies have been done looking at the effects of cannabis over the last 40 years were done with cannabis supplied from that one farm in Mississippi. And so just some questions for thought, for reflection. Do you think that cannabis grown by the federal government in Mississippi reflects the cannabis in the real world? You know, why or why not? And um, how might it be different? And how might that impact our knowledge about the effects of cannabis? We've actually done a little bit of work on this. Again, this is in collaboration with Nolan Cain. But just looking at how if we take the um, test results from cannabis produced by the government farm in Mississippi, how does that compare to cannabis results uh, tested from, uh, from legal markets? This is a paper that was published. You saw the citation earlier. But basically, this is the, the NIDA cannabis. This is the National Institute of Drug Abuse um, cannabis that comes from Mississippi compared to testing uh, varieties from Denver and Oakland and Sacramento and Seattle. And basically what you see is that, um, and this was done a few years ago, things have changed since then, but CBD clearly lower in the government version, THC clearly lower in the government version, um, CBG pretty much on uh, par with the other ones, and then they, they um, didn't provide test results for other cannabinoids like, other cannabinoids like THCV. So we don't really know. So what's different about uh, the government-grown uh, cannabis? Well, uh, obviously lower THC and lower CBD. Um, we don't really know about some of the other other cannabinoids or terpenes. And again, that was done a few years ago. And I have to say, having worked closely with people at night, uh, um, they clearly have been um, catching up, playing catch-up, but now also doing a pretty good job at catching up. And uh, so things are different now in terms of the products coming out of NIDA more closely mirroring the state legalized markets. Um, having said that, though, of course, it's almost impossible to keep up. It, you know, To expect one small production facility and government-run facility in Mississippi to keep up with the legal market as fast as it's developing across the nation that's an impossible task. So I, I feel, you know, uh, some sympathy for them because this is a very difficult thing to do. But then, you know, the federal government, their hands are completely tied um, by the federal laws and by the DEA. So it makes it very difficult to keep up. Okay, so summarize three, at least three major lineages of cannabis, including hemp, broadleaf drug types, narrowleaf drug types. And these lineages differ in terms of the chemical profile, in terms of cannabinoids and terpenes. And that is a partial explanation for why people report very, uh, you know, report differences in effects. Even though, for example, THC may be equal across strains, people report different effects um, because it's not just THC that drives the effects, there are other chemicals in the plant that also drive effects. And that is all for this lecture.